Hello, everybody. How are you doing today? <laughs> it's quiet out there. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're here to talk a little bit about uh, the Spiffy Inspire uh, projects and security assessment that Matt, myself, and a few others did over the last year or so. Um, my name is Evan Gilman. I'm an engineer at SciTail, and I'm working actively on the Spiffy Inspire projects um, pretty much full time now. Uh, as previously an SRE at PagerDuty, uh, doing automation, traffic management, and things along those lines, um, and was a network engineer in academia in a previous life. And I'm here with Matt today. My name is Matt Moyer. Uh, at the beginning of this week, I was a security engineer at Heptio. As of uh, yesterday afternoon, I'm a, a security engineer at VMware, because our acquisition went through. Um, prior to that, I, worked at a, I was a security engineer at a, a small bank. Uh, doing Kubernetes migration. Um, so what are, we, what are we here for? What's this all about? Uh, so before we get started, how many people in the room have heard of Spiffy? It's good. How many people are using Spiffy in some capacity? Huh. Cool. How many people are using Spire? Have played with Spire, we'll say. Cool. Uh, so if you do know about Spiffy, you know that security is one of the key components for why you would use Spiffy. It's not the only one, but it's one of the, one of the key ones. Um, so what we really want to do uh, is understand what are the expected security properties of a Spiffy system, um, and then how close are we to sort of meeting those expected properties? Where are there gaps? Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely an important thing to get right. Um, so in doing so, it, it, it's really important to validate these decisions early on, uh, before it's too late to correct. Uh, so we want to make sure we're kind of just heading in the right direction here. Um, in order to do this, we embarked on a, a somewhat lengthy security assessment um, where really we were just interested in studying like the Spiffy Spire security model, um, trying to describe its properties, and then trying to analyze the overall design for weaknesses in delivering on those properties. And this effort uh, was kicked off in December 2017. Uh, it was led by Justin Kapos who's here today, and uh, with participation from myself, from Matt, and, and from Enrico, uh, who are community members who raised their hand and volunteered to put a lot of time, <laughs> put a lot of time in, basically. And the goals of this effort uh, were first to understand the expected security properties of a Spiffy implementation. Like, what properties are important given, given Spiffy's mission? And second, we wanted to explore different classes of vulnerabilities, like, Given the properties that we know are important to Spiffy, how might an attacker abuse a system like this? And finally, uh, we wanted to take this learning and understanding and apply it to the Spiffy-inspired design. Uh, where are their weak points, and how bad are those weak points, uh, and how might we be able to change a design to, to improve that stance? So, of course, like any WellScope project, we had a couple non-goals as well. Um, we weren't really interested in finding, like, specific implementation vulnerabilities. Uh, things like bugs and authorization checks, et cetera, are, are kind of out of scope for this assessment. Uh, instead, we wanted to focus on the overall design and architecture of, of the Spire system and the Spiffy specification set. Uh, we, weren't, we also were not um, interested in like formally proving anything, so this is definitely not a, a formalized threat model, as, as some people might be familiar with. Uh, rather, this is a tool uh, that will help us analyze the security properties and the weaknesses in the system as it evolves over time. Sure. Uh, so we're gonna. This is what we're gonna go through today. Um, what we really hope is that when you when you leave this talk, you're going to uh, feel comfortable talking about what are the expected security properties of Spiffy, um, and whether that means you feel more comfortable with an existing installation that you're doing or you feel more comfortable proceeding down the path of uh, adopting Spiffy in some capacity, or uh, maybe understanding that Spiffy's expected security properties don't work for your use case. Any of those is fine. Um, so we're gonna start off with a, a quick intro to uh, what is Spiffy, how does Spiffy work, uh, also what is Spire, how does Spire work. Um, I'm gonna talk about what are the expected properties of the system. This is sort of the, the, the meat of the presentation. Um, we're gonna talk about how we came up with that list, what was our methodology, and then finally, Evan's gonna present some findings. Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, so I think that most of these presentations start out with a pretty basic question of like, what is Spiffy? Um, 
for those of you who don't know, there, there, were, there were a handful of, of folks. Um, SPIFI stands for Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone, right? Um, and what SPIFI actually is is a specification. Um, more accurately, it's a specification set, right? It's, it's more than one specification. Uh, and the goal of, of these specs is to provide this idea of notion of a interoperable and portable workload identity, which is platform agnostic. Um, and in order to do that, uh, we, we define an identity namespace. Uh, we define like a set of documents uh, and interfaces, uh, and, and together those things are used to publish, consume, and authenticate these these workload identities. Um, but I think like the the most important thing to kind of drive home here is that Spiffy is not code. Uh, Spiffy is, is simply a specification. So let's take a look at uh, some of the major components of Spiffy. Uh, the first is what we call the Spiffy ID. Well, it's basically a structured string. You can see it's, it's a URI, um, and, and it can be kind of thought of as like a username for workloads. Right? It's divided into two parts. Uh, this first part here is, is called the trust domain, and the second part is, is called the path. Um, and so in this example, um, the trust domain is prod.example, and foo is the path. Right? Um, a trust domain nominally represents a, an issuing authority, so usually what you see is a, a trust domain is generally tied to a set of signing keys. Um, and, and any identity issued within this trust domain is, is signed and authorized by uh, this issuing authority. Next, we have something called a Spiffy Verifiable Identity Document, uh, this SVID for short. And uh, these, are, these are basically just digitally signed documents that prove ownership of a, of a particular identity or a Spiffy identity. Um, there's already lots of documents uh, out there and, and common use, and so there's really no need for Spiffy to invent new ones. Um, so as a result, these SVID specs, they, they tend to just set restrictions and rules on top of existing document types. Uh, so, you know, as of today, we have two supported document types. One is an X79 certificate, and the other is JOT. Finally, we need a way to uh, kind of standardize the, the, the way that these SVIDs are issued and consumed. Like, where do they come from? How do I get one? Should I find it on disk? Um, where, 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 where can I locate my identity and, and my identity documents? And so to solve this, Spiffy includes a specification called the Spiffy Workload API. The workload API is a node local API that, that workloads use to retrieve their identity and their documents. And crucially, this API is, is not authenticated. And this is really, really important because it solves this, this bootstrap problem. Um, some people call it the secret zero problem or secure introduction. Um, but it allows workloads to have no a priori knowledge of, of their identity. So you basically deploy a workload, the first, it comes up, the first thing it does is it talks to this API, it doesn't have to know anything else. The API says, I know you, here are your keys, and here's your cert, and, and you're off to the races. Uh, so in summary, there's three major components uh, in this Spiffy specification set as it exists today. There's uh, the Spiffy ID, there's these SVIDs, these documents, and then there's this workload API part. Uh, and together, these things uh, form this kind of foundational identity layer uh, that can span heterogeneous software stacks and platforms because they're not fundamentally bound to those things. Uh, they're independent. Um, so now that we, we understand a little bit more about what Spiffy is, uh, have a quick look at Spire. Spire is also an acronym. It is short for the Spiffy Runtime Environment. Um, and Spire is an open source implementation of the Spiffy specification set. Its basic mission in life uh, is to light up that workload API and, and also make it manageable. Uh, and so to do this, Spire, Spire includes an agent which is capable of being the server component actually, actually lighting up and turning on this workload API on a node-by-node -node basis. And this workload API is exposed in the Spire case over a Unix domain socket. Um, of course, there can be many workloads on a single host. So and as you may remember, I just mentioned that it's unauthenticated, so the agent has to have a way to kind of understand who is calling it and, and, and authorize the issuance based on the caller. Uh, so the way that uh, Spire agent accomplishes this is through a concept that we call workload attestation. Um, this allows uh, the agent to serve a single endpoint 
uh, that all identities are issued over on a, on a node-by-node -node basis, and, and it remains secure even if file system ACLs are, uh, are misconfigured or there's some other uh, fat finger in a system. There, it's not necessary to protect this actual socket because the agent performs all the security checks. So basically how that works is that when a workload starts up, as I mentioned, it calls this workload API. That's basically the first thing. Um, and the agent then reads a special socket option off the kernel um, that results in the process ID of the caller. The agent then uses this process ID uh, to interrogate the Linux kernel and find out more about that particular workload. Um, things like username, group, cgroup membership, the path on disk, things along these lines are all discoverable uh, at that point in time. And this, this discovery logic, this attestation logic is also pluggable. Uh, so for instance, a Kubernetes plugin uh, can take this information and then call the kubelet and say, hey, tell me everything you know about this thing. So, um, so this allows the agent to, to further obtain information, things like service account, namespace, labels on the pod spec, uh, Docker image ID, stuff like that. Um, and then using all this in information, kind of like taking it all and banning it in, um, the agent is able to identify the caller and then issue the correct identity to that particular caller, regardless of, of what permissions have been set or otherwise. Um, so there's still some open questions, I think, here. Uh, you know, we collect all this information about the process, uh, but you still need to know, like, what spiffy ID do I give it based on this information? Uh, you also need someone to sign that SVID, you know? Um, something has to authorize the signing and, and then mint it and issue it, and if you do it in the agent, then, then there are, there are uh, security issues, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so to solve this problem, um, Spire implements a server component. Uh, so all the agents connect back to a server or a set of servers. And uh, when an SVID is needed, an agent submits a request uh, to this server. And the server then authorizes the request and then signs the SVID and returns it. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the, the signing keys are centralized. And that's kind of an important property because um, it prevents a single compromised agent uh, from being able to mint arbitrary identities. Um, and, and that gives us one of the really important security properties, at least I think, um, that Matt will talk a little bit about later in the assessment. And so in addition to uh, signing these SVIDs, the server also maintains this identity registry. Uh, so basically it understands how to map these various workload properties that the agents are discovering to an actual spiffy ID. Um, it also is able to map workloads to an agent or a set of agents. Um, and this lets us like, limit the number of agents which are authorized to request a particular identity, which, which again aids in um, this property of limiting blast radius if a particular agent is compromised. Um, this mapping, uh, if you will, is, is, is maintained what we call the registration API. Um, so there's like this registry of, of identity mappings, essentially. Uh, and this API can be accessed by humans with CLI utilities, or it can be maintained uh, by an automated system with a scripts or an orchestrator or something like this. Um, and, and these workloads, uh, these spiffy IDs get registered with what we call an entry, a registration entry. Um, an entry consists of, uh, quite simply, just the spiffy ID, those properties we discussed, what, what, is this, what are the natural properties of this workload and how do I know when to issue this spiffy ID? And then also the agents or group of agents that uh, this, this workload can run on. Uh, so with this information together, you can see kind of how, how SVID issuance is managed in the Spire system. Um, of course, a system like this is, is quite sensitive security-wise, and, and as I mentioned, it's really important to validate these architectural decisions uh, early on in the process, hence the motivation for undertaking uh, all, all this stuff we're talking about today. Um, so now that we have a little bit more background about Spiffy and Spire, and, and, and this, particularly the Spire architecture, I'm gonna pass it off to Matt. Um, he's gonna share some of the security properties we expect from a system like this, as well as uh, what kind of properties are, are really critically important. Yeah, uh, so hopefully you got a general kind of picture from Evan that, that this is a complicated system, right? It's a distributed system with a lot of heterogeneous components. Um, you have different nodes. Nodes have a concept of kind of a blast radius. You have heterogeneous workloads running on nodes. Uh, and the security properties are kind of subtle, right? There are certain, uh, uh, certain cases where we expect the system to fail. Uh, if, if you compromise the server, the server has the signing keys for the, the trust domain. We expect that to be kind of game over. Um, there's other cases where uh, we really want to say that an uh, attacker really shouldn't be able to do anything. Uh, so an attacker that compromises a single workload on a single node, 
uh, should only be able to get the identities for that workload. Um, and then there's a range of cases in between, right? Um, so to sort of explore this space, uh, we thought about several different dimensions. Uh, and the first dimension we thought about is what is the attacker's goal? Uh, what, what, it, what is it they're trying to get at? Um, so for example, uh, kind of like the, the most basic attack in a system like this is I want to impersonate another workload, an, another node agent, or the server. Um, I am not that entity, but I want to pretend to be that entity. Um, another one is I might want to just shut, up, shut down part of the system, and uh, maybe that would take down your production website. Um, another kind of a uh, little bit more subtle take on the, on the uh, impersonation is I might want to grab some sort of signing key so that I can forge identities out of thin air for any name I want, even if it doesn't exist. Um, similarly, I might want to uh, have a legitimate identity. So let's say I'm a workload, I have a legitimate identity. I want to uh, modify the permissions associated with my identity in some part of the system. And this comes into play particularly because the Spire server is doing authorization based on spiffy IDs. Uh, it's using those authorization, uh, that authorization logic to decide sort of which node agents are allowed to issue which identities. Uh, so there's sort of an opportunity for that to get out of whack. Um, another kind of a little bit more subtle attack might be I want to trick uh, another piece of software into using the wrong identity. So maybe this would mean that uh, I talk to something like the Kubernetes API server. It's going to be making a request on my behalf. It's supposed to be making that request with my identity, uh, but I can somehow, let's say, trick it into using its very powerful identity instead. And that creates sort of a confused deputy kind of attack. Um, and then there's sort of the... Uh, the biggest one here, which is uh, maybe I just want to get remote code execution in some part of the system, and then that lets me do some other arbitrary set of things that might be, uh, might be fun for me as an attacker. So that, that's one dimension that we looked at. Another dimension we looked at is uh, kind of like where it's the starting state of this whole system. Uh, we assume that part of the system starts out compromised. Um, so it could be uh, the Spire server is compromised. Turns out you're going to have a bad day if your Spire server is compromised. Um, but it could be that uh, one, a single node agent is compromised. It could be that a single workload is compromised. And so we wanted to consider all of those cases um, in our analysis. And then the final dimension that we looked at is uh, what kind of superpowers do you have as an attacker? So if every piece of software worked perfectly and had no bugs, it would be pretty, reason, pretty easy to reason about the security properties of the system. Um, but we know in reality that code is broken, and it's broken in all kinds of weird, interesting ways. Uh, most of which we can't really predict. But what we tried to do was come up with some plausible vulnerability, vulnerability classes based on the type of code that we use to build Spire, uh, how much, which pieces of code are accessible to different attackers. Um, and so, for example, we, uh, the Spire server is written in Go. Um, there's a bunch of Go code that deals with attacker-supplied data. One of those is the CSR parser. CSR is a certificate signing request. Uh, it's an ASN.1 format. It's kind of a tricky binary format. Um, you know, the, it's, th this parser in Go is written in a memory-safe language, so it's probably not going to have a, a certain set of uh, buffer overflow vulnerabilities, but maybe there's something weird that we don't understand, or maybe there's a, a bug that combines, uh, you know, something wrong in the CSR parser with something wrong in the Go runtime, for example. Um, similarly, uh, we, we have to use the uh, Go's X509 certificate parser, uh, we, have to, we have to run that on uh, bytes that are supplied by an attacker before we know who they are. Uh, so that can be dangerous. Um, and then there's a whole set of other kind of uh, pieces of the protocol stack that end up being involved in servicing re uh, requests. Uh, and this is code that sort of handle, that's code that is uh, run before the request is authenticated. So this is Go's TLS stack, uh, the HTTP uh, handlers, and then the gRPC runtime. Uh, so remote code execution is kind of the, the, uh, the, the big one, but there's a whole slew of kind of more subtle vulnerabilities that we wanted to consider. Um, so, for example, the isolation between the workload and the uh, node agent, the Spire agent, relies on some sort of sandbox mechanism, usually Linux containers. Um, it's reasonable to suppose that there could be vulnerabilities in that mechanism. Um, we want to know how those would affect the system, assuming an attacker has that, that superpower. Um, we also want to account for cases, obviously, where an attacker can manipulate network traffic in kind of arbitrary ways. Um, we also considered a class of vulnerabilities where you're able to submit some sort of malformed a certificate signing request or a certificate, 
Uh, it might not get you remote code execution, but it gets you some sort of weird certificate. And, and we're just kind of supposing that this is a class of vulnerabilities without understanding anything about really what the properties of this might be. We're just saying that, hey, maybe something weird could happen here. Let's think about what would happen if there was something weird here. Uh, and then finally, uh, kind of uh, a pretty easy attack for anyone. This is, this is an attack you can do by accident, uh, is overwhelm a part of the system with requests. Um, we also considered a class of vulnerabilities where we thought we fixed something and we didn't. So we, we, we have some sort of security control inspire that should have mitigated um, a particular problem, but something was broken with that control. So either it could be uh, bypassed or uh, it didn't work in some case. Um, so with these three dimensions, we became state space explorers. We really like, wanted to uh, explore every possible combination of these states, say, uh, you know, as an attacker, how could I, what could I do with this set of superpowers if I start on this node? Uh, what kind of states can I get the system into? Uh, and what do we expect Spire to do in that state? And why? Like, which, which security controls in Spire are relevant to that case? Um, are they adequate? Are there any kind of weird bypasses we can think of? And this is really an exercise then in discussion. Like, we really spent a lot of time just talking about this. Um, so it involved a lot of talking, and this is where we kind of, we're gonna drop the curtain, I have to level with you, you all came to a talk about a spreadsheet. <laughs> this is really a talk about collecting a bunch of data, building a giant spreadsheet. Um, the contents of the spreadsheet represent sort of six months of, you know, hundreds of hours of discussion uh, from people who were involved in building the system um, and security experts and just trying, trying to understand all the kind of nuances of how we expect the system to behave. And, and what we hope is that this serves as documentation moving forward. Um, and then we also hope that it could sort of highlight interesting places where we might need to do a little more work or we're kind of falling short. Um, and so to kind of do that, that ranking, um, we uh, did some estimating. So one thing we estimated was how severe is an attack on different parts of the system and different types of attacks. So we looked at, uh, for example, the uh, full compromise attack. My goal as an attacker is to run code on this component. Um, how bad is that if it happens to your server? Real bad. How bad is that if that happens to an individual container? Not nearly so bad, right? And these are not supposed to be exact numbers. Um, this is, um, like, like Evan said at the beginning, this is not supposed to be a, a super formalized kind of um, uh, model of the system. It's, it's more like uh, exercise in pooling our brains and trying to understand what we collectively can figure out. Um, but you can see this is a log scale. Uh, and so this is kind of what we hope for, which is that some types of attacks are orders of magnitude more important than others. Um, so we also looked at all of those different superpowers that I talked about, those, uh, those vulnerability classes, uh, and we looked at how likely do we think those are to happen in the future? How likely are we to get new uh, CSR, uh, remote code execution vulnerabilities in Go's CSR stack, uh, compared to how likely is it, uh, for example, that uh, someone is, has a man-in-the-middle capability on a production network? And again, we were able to see Collectively, we more or less agreed on orders of magnitude for how likely different kind of these, these classes are. Uh, and so taking, taking those two scores, the uh, impact score, but kind of like how, how bad is it if you hit a certain cell of this, ma this matrix, and uh, how likely is it that you're gonna have the set of vulnerabilities you need to, to get to that state, uh, we were able to do kind of a joint ranking. So this is like every cell in this matrix, which ones are the worst? So if you're over here on the uh, left-hand side of this, this chart, that means uh, the impact is pretty high, so this is pretty bad for you if this happens to your production network, uh, and the uh, capabilities an attacker needs to, to get to that state are, we think, relatively likely to happen. And likewise, if you're over on the, uh, on the far right inside of this scale, either the attack doesn't really matter that much because uh, it's, it's not gonna really impact the operation of the system, or requires a vulnerability that we think is gonna be really rare. And again, this is just based on our kind of collective wild guess. So I'm gonna turn things over to Evan uh, to talk now about uh, our findings. Okay. So six months, what was it? Eight months worth yeah, of I talking? Think, Something yeah. like that. Uh, <laughs> what, what, did, what did all that talking and, and, and uh, spreadsheet learning uh, give us? I think that uh, there are a couple pieces of things that popped up pretty clearly and immediately. Um, after analyzing all this data that we compiled. Um, the first thing was rate limiting. 
Um, and, and this is not like really a surprise that it was required. The surprise actually was more kind of a, a, in the magnitude of that final score that was computed, you know. Um, the impact of a DOS uh, attack, for instance, on the Spire server multiplied by how easy it is to mount was like, oh my god, this is clearly like a big problem. Um, so, you know, as soon as we saw, saw those numbers, we, we went ahead and we patched Spire server uh, relatively quickly. Um, second thing that we found was uh, that CSR parsing that Matt was talking about, um, you know, CSR is, is, is a relatively standard way for fulfilling a, a request for a new X509 certificate. Um, so when we were designing Spire originally, we didn't really put much thought into it. We said, well, the agent needs a cert, so, you know, we're going to use a, a CSR for that. Um, but after some discussion, we kind of realized that the CSR processing code is, is a source of vulnerability, potential vulnerability, um, particularly in that, you know, the libraries to, process, to, to parse and process these CSRs are, are not anywhere close to as well exercised as the X509 libraries are, for instance, under Golang. Um, we further realized that the semantics that a CSR gives aren't really required uh, for Spire security or functionality at all. Um, so as a result, uh, even though uh, the CSR-related vulnerabilities were not, not necessarily the very, very top of the list, they, they weren't insignificant, and um, reflecting on this and realizing that we don't actually need this thing, uh, we're, we're under discussion right now to remove CSR processing altogether from the Spire architecture. Um, but overall, I, I think there, there weren't any like giant surprises here. Um, we definitely identified a few things that we can improve. Um, but we generally achieved the security properties that, that we were aiming to achieve uh, with this architecture. Of course, that's not to say that there aren't any problems. You know, we, there, there certainly we, we might have overlooked things, but certainly this kind of uh, first path is, is first pass is a very reassuring one. Um, Took a long time to do this, as, as you know, we mentioned once or twice. Um, but now that we have these tools, we have these matrices, we have the scores, we have we understand like how to approach this problem. It's really easy to kind of keep this up. Um, so as the project evolves over time, these spreadsheets can be updated and the scores can be updated and maintained, and, and which will allow us to like measurably track uh, the security posture of the Spiffy and Spire projects over time, which I think is ultra ultra cool. Um, and if Civi Inspire is important to you, then, then certainly this data, I think, would, would, would also be of interest and important to you, and, and hopefully can uh, help you to guide decisions that you make in your deployment and implementation of, of Spiffy or Aspire systems. I know that we uh, have certainly found it very helpful to have around. Um, we're also looking for more volunteers. There, there was just four of us uh, that, that worked on this thing, and it was a ton of work, and, and you know, part of the scoring exercise and everything um, requires different perspectives to be involved and different opinions to be injected. So um, if, if you guys are interested in, in helping out on this front, uh, we would love to have you uh, have some more eyes on this assessment and, and poke holes or wherever uh, you possibly can. And if you're interested in helping out, um, I, either in this security assessment or, or anything else, if you're just even looking for more information, um, please do join the Slack Spiffy Slack organization. Uh, any and all questions are welcome about this or, or anything else, really. Um, We'd love to see you there. Um, you can also find a lot of information on our GitHub repos. Uh, the, the Spire repo uh, here in the middle is the one with uh, the Spire code base, and then the bottom one here, Spiffy Spiffy, is the one that has all the Spiffy specifications, uh, as well as uh, information about the community, regular calls, uh, uh, things along those lines. And uh, that's all we've got for you today. Thank you for coming. Hope you're enjoying KubeCon, and we have some time for questions, maybe? So, the, yeah. let Justin the, take so the, the question is, uh, we decided not to use formal methods, but sort of how would you approach applying formal methods to, to the system as a... Well, now, how, how, can I, how can I, you know, raise my confidence that... Yeah. Uh, that the yes. How, how could you raise your confidence higher about, about this work? All right. So uh, the general technique that we used in this, the way we did things with threat models and uh, other types of um, refinement of threat categories, is a technique uh, that we invented called ABC that we've used in a couple of other ways. 
and I'm very happy to uh, provide more information about this. We have a publication coming out about it, and would be happy to talk more about it. So uh, please reach out to, to me or to anybody on the team here, and they'll get you in touch with me about it. A, a big part of this project, too, was you know, uh, a lot of this knowledge existed like in Evan's head and some of the people who had worked really deeply in the code. We really wanted to get it out, out of Evan's head into a spreadsheet so that we can bring more people on to the project who might, be able, might bring a different skill set with formal methods or, or other ways of thinking about the problem. Yeah, uh, I would say this specific spreadsheet is very specific to, to Spire uh, because the, the kind of the, what I call the attacker superpowers, that kind of vulnerability classes, were really things that specifically apply to Spire and the specific code that makes up Spire. Uh, the methodology in general is generally applicable. And yeah. you can look up some of Justin's papers on other systems. <laughs> yeah, you, you might be able to draw some commonality with like you know, attacker starting position, different components, classes of vulnerabilities, and then like, okay, like how do you score them, which components get scored, and how do those scores come together? All that stuff might be applied generally rather than specific to Spire, but the values of, of, of those things are pretty Spire specific. And I know that Justin has been working with CNCF on, on trying to uh, kind of come up with a, a generalized model for this that is a little bit more lightweight than what we did here with Spiffy and Spire that can be applied to CNCF projects that uh, are, are coming on board. I think it's also good that we hit a lot of nuances and actually changed our methodology throughout this project. So like something we kind of discovered um, about a third of the way through was that the way we were thinking about attacker starting positions and, and desired attacker states uh, wasn't quite nuanced enough. So there's, there's this idea, and we simplified it a little bit for the slides, but the difference between uh, having compromised a workload and attacking a workload on the same node versus attacking a workload on another node. Uh, and we expect in general that um, nodes can be sort of isolated into these like, sort of blast zones um, and so it's not as big a deal. It should not be as big a deal to compromise another workload in your same zone as it is to compromise something in another zone. That's, that's a case where like, we spent three months talking about this and then realized, like, oh, yeah, we actually need like, more dimensions in this problem. Um, and so uh, that's a case where the, the matrix ended up pretty specifically applied to, to Spire. Let's get in the back here. So the question is, are there any special considerations for bootstrapping the Spire agent to securely introduce it to the Spire server? Absolutely. Um, I left it out of this talk because I didn't think that it was uh, very important for, for the scope of the review that we were doing. Um, but the same kind of way that I talked about workload attestation, there's also a concept of node attestation, which leverages platform providers and other things like this in order to validate the identity of the caller um, when it's not a, a, a local process. So for, yeah, for example, if, you are, uh, if your node is an EC2 instance, it might use the EC2 metadata API uh, to prove its identity to the Spire server. And we can think similarly of like other cloud providers, or you might have an on-premises environment where you attest the state of the machine using a TPM things like that, like the Spire itself is pluggable enough to kind of support all kinds of different mechanisms in different environments. No, it, it so the question was, um, we were saying that, that CSR is a potential source of vulnerability and that maybe we could remove it. And, and, and does that mean that we're looking to move away from X509 entirely and, and prefer uh, Jot instead? Um, the answer, I think, there is, is definitely no. What, what we found was that the, Sp uh, the Spire server knows uh, what identity is supposed to be issued and the format of that certificate and if it's authorized or not. Um, what we really wanted to prevent was, like, carte blanche, like, number one, like, copy and pasting a CSR into the cert and then signing it and sending it back. Like, you could put all kinds of subject values and other things in there that the server has no way of validating. Um, furthermore, you know, exercising all that parsing logic, as I mentioned before, is a risk. And, and so at the end of the day, really, um, all the Spire server needs to know is the public key. Public key, and, and it can create a cert with the right Spiffy ID with the public key in it, sign it and send it back, and we can kind of sidestep this whole CSR back and forth. 
Um, so definitely X509, I think, is still kind of like the main SVID format and the one that we would recommend above all else uh, when, when it's possible to use it. Um, but we just, the, the guarantees and, and properties that, a, that the commonly used CSR process follows doesn't really buy us much, and so we might as well cut it out. All right, thanks. Okay. We'll be in the back for more questions. Yeah, thank you, everyone.